Greetings and thank you for joining me on the Vision Victory channel. I'm very pleased to have a special guest with us today. Andy Hoffman goes by the blog name of Ranting Andy. I've been reading his blogs for a year. He's actually been doing this for over five years, really focusing on getting the message out on what's going on with the precious metals. He is now the Miles Franklin Marketing Director. Andy, thank you so much for taking the time with us today. Absolutely, Daniel. Andy, I'd like to get right into things. Uh, earlier in the summer, you were screaming from the rooftops. It's it's about to go down. The end game is here. Uh, I read those messages and took those to heart. Things seem to be unfolding right now, literally, as, as we do this interview. Where are we in the crisis right now? Uh, well, I guess uh, in the big picture, the crisis started uh, a decade ago, and it was... Uh, finally reached the critical mass point about three years ago when we hit Global Meltdown 1. Essentially, all the money printing and, uh, you know, banker deregulation created a scenario that uh, after a measly eight or nine years, we get to 2008, and there's too much debt in the world. We get to debt saturation, and uh, and then the central banks had to scramble to figure out how to pay it back. Um, people like uh, myself and people in kind of our world realized it was not able to be paid back, but a significant portion of the media and investment community uh, believed that the bailouts of three years ago would actually turn the tide. Um, they basically bought two or three years of uh, market calm and, and kind of a, uh, a sigh of relief that somehow maybe things were better because of all these, uh, these uh, printed money bailouts, but it didn't take more than the two years for people to realize that's not the case. Uh, we're now entering the phase where bailouts will no longer work. And as a result, you're seeing um, inflation around the world. You're seeing deflation of paper assets. And you're seeing the point where where the markets are going to realize that the bailouts won't work anymore. A lot of investors, including myself, uh, you know, we're loaded up on precious metals. We have some mining stocks. But I personally, and I know I've talked to others, are concerned that we're going to go into another 2008 repeat where we see silver get smashed, we see gold get smashed. Do you think we're going into a 2008 crisis, or is this one going to be different? Well, I certainly think we're going into a crisis, and, uh, you know, per what I've been writing, and I guess, you know, Math 101 would say that this will be a lot worse, because, again, 2008 was just a prelude. It was kind of a, a harbinger of what was to come. You see, you saw banks crashing and central banks uh, scrambling to print money. Uh, that's what's happening now, except this time the money printing won't work. Last time there was a, a, a rush to liquidity. Uh, the markets believed that, uh, that sovereign debt was the place to go and the U.S. dollar. I think what you've seen in the last uh, two or three years is people realizing that the dollar index per se really has no meaning. People are not rushing into the dollar right now. They're, in, you know, I mean, the, the sovereigns of the world are rushing out of the dollar. But for the most part, people are just trying to figure out a way, the individual investor, of where to go where they don't lose all their money. Uh, precious metals in 2008 uh, was, was smashed down by the cartel. I mean, their modus operandi is to make sure that safe havens are viewed to be treasury bonds and the dollar. And like I said, the dollar is no longer being viewed as a safe haven anywhere, so it's between treasury bonds and gold. We know very well that QE has taken treasury bond interest rates in the States down to zero, uh, whereas in Europe, QE hasn't worked at all as rates are hitting all-time highs. The, uh, the physical market, as a note, in 2008, dramatically separated from the paper market. Uh, I would say 2008 probably saw the widest premiums uh, in modern history between paper and physical because what happened in the paper markets was not reflecting reality. Now, the problem uh, with people making the perception that there was this big smash in 2008 is that the mining stocks do reflect the paper price. Their offtake agreements are based on the paper price, so if the cartel wants to take the price down, they will lose money. And most people in the precious metal sector are heavily into mining stocks. I know that from personal experience, and I know that from pretty much everyone that I've dealt with. I have now switched over to 100% bullion because I know for a fact that that market, even in the worst case scenario where you had a short-term liquidity crash, is not going to go down like the paper markets. And again, the paper 
the mining stocks and paper uh, gold instruments such as GLD are tied to the paper market that the government has control over at the moment. I believe they will lose control over the paper market this time around because I, I don't think that the safe haven uh, protection, or I should say what the government wants you to believe safe havens uh, to be is going to work this time. Uh, but I do believe either way that the physical market is going to be the strongest place for your money, uh, even in a short-term uh, a short-term liquidity drain. And ultimately, and I mean ultimately as in sometime in 2012, you're going to see the long-awaited uh, fleeing of capital around the world into physical metal, which will probably result in, the high, in even higher premiums than 2008 and obviously all-time high prices. Now, do you see investors going to SLV and GLD, or do you see people actually de wanting to demand delivery at the COMEX? Uh, well, I wouldn't say the COMEX. The COMEX is, is only for very, very large investors. Um, uh, you know, I, I've been – let's talk about large investors and, and then first and then small investors. Large investors have for year have always viewed COMEX and the paper prices uh, to be real because they don't understand – uh, the manipulation, they don't understand the fractional banking. So they've taken it uh, as gospel that GLD is a real instrument that owns gold and that the COMEX is a real way to to, um, to buy gold. Uh, probably 90% plus, probably 95% plus of all COMEX contracts are never delivered anyway. So it's not like they really are buying gold there anyway. They're speculating on gold. And, uh, and uh, so as far as the, the big investors... Uh, the big question has always been, well, if uh, you have a big explosion in gold prices, what will the open interest do in COMEX? Will it explode to record highs and then they'll take all the gold out? Or will it fall because people um, are scared and they're going to go to physical metal? And I think you're getting uh, – what you're, what you're seeing is what I kind of anticipated would happen was people have lost so much money in the paper markets – that they are fleeing the market. Open interest is at a not a record low, but compared to the price of uh, of gold, it's as low as it's been since I've been watching for the last 15 years. People have had uh, so many losses on the short side and the long side care of the gold cartel that they're just not uh, taking the risk that they used to in, in the COMEX market anymore, and they're looking for different ways to invest. Uh, the same goes with GLD. Uh, the, the biggest, the largest owner of GLD is the hedge fund uh, run uh, operator John Paulson, uh, who is most famous now for ripping off investors with Goldman Sachs by shorting uh, mortgage securities. He also was arrogant enough to believe that by holding GLD, he he uh, had leverage to the gold market. As it turns out, he's lost billions of dollars on that position because of the smashes we've had this year. And he's had a run on his fund and horrible results, and he is not going to get the gains of gold prices going up as a result. People are going to see what he's done in the GLD, and they're going to realize that the only place that you are safe from those kind of uh, margin leveraged investments in gold speculation is the physical market. Now, as for the small investor, I believe the small investor is more apt to go into physical metal because they just have it's their own money as opposed to other people's money. They are not the people who, have, who can move the market, uh, the gold, the physical gold market. It's the big players that can move it. But I do believe that the small investors are more likely to move first into the gold coins, the silver coins. And, uh, you know, sometime amidst this, you know, kind of market rubble that I expect to see, the big players are going to realize as well that the COMEX, the GLD, are not places uh, to uh, protect your money. And they're going to en masse, try to buy the little physical that's out there. Now, keep in mind, aside from the shortages we saw at the bottoms of the market, like in 2008, I'm talking about physical shortages, we also saw them at the tops of the market. Uh, from my uh, experience now in the bullion industry, I've learned that April was probably the busiest month that most of the brokers have seen in their lifetimes. And that was what that was when you had relatively benign conditions, except silver was, uh, was having a nice little surge. That was greed-based. When we have a fear-based move at a, at a high, I think you're going to see levels of shortage that people can't even imagine. And for the people who have had a long-term strategy of, uh, well, we'll sell our mining stocks when they go up and buy gold, I think they're going to find that the gold won't be there if indeed the mining stocks do go up that high. 
Now, now, when you write about the gold cartel, you've shown some charts uh, several months ago. Uh, I want to say it was around May that was just a sh was just shocking, uh, where gold is getting smashed. It's getting capped almost consistently every single day. Um, when you talk about the gold cartel, it's like breathing for you. It's very natural. For many people, they're not familiar with it. Could you just talk about the gold cartel? Uh, why are they doing what they're doing? And as well as a you know kind of a devil's advocate question, um, what do you say to people say, hey, wait a minute, the metals have been rising for 10 years. What are you talking about, gold cartel? Right. Well, the gold cartel, or let, let's just say the concept of gold suppression is as old as <laughs> is as old as the uh, the age of money itself. I mean, you talk about uh, we had gold standards, which mean pegged gold prices. It was twenty dollars in the thirties, then it was thirty five dollars up until the sixties. We had the London Gold Pool in the nineteen sixties, which was essentially actually not essentially it was an overt gold cartel led by, as always, the U.S. government to peg the price of gold at thirty-five dollars. Uh, that too failed, and uh, and then you know we had the the tremendous surge in the seventies of the gold price. Uh, you know then when uh, there was a commodities uh, there was a commodities depression for about fifteen years, but once uh, it started up again, uh, but in two thousand they had to start up the gold cartel uh, operations again, and this time they didn't do it uh, overtly. They've been doing it covertly. The the footprints are are all over the place. I uh, got into this this gold cartel study back in 2002, 2003, uh, when I started reading uh, the Gold Antitrust Action Committee or GATA, uh, which is basically uh, it's a, it's to me it's a think tank of the smart people in the business who pull out the proof of uh, gold manipulation, and it's real proof. It's admissions from the top people, and there are plenty of them. But more importantly, I watch the markets. I've been watching tick for tick for, for almost 10 years now. It's pretty obvious those reports you're talking about. Uh, I've documented, I and others, but probably me more than anyone as regards the specifics of what they do on a day-to-day -day basis, the specific times, the specific methods. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's become very, very easy to spot. Uh, I even penned a, a piece uh, today uh, called D-Day Anniversary, because a year ago, November 9th, 2010, uh, was the first time that I actually saw the gold cartel show some fear. Uh, that was when silver was first about to take out $30. They uh, obviously changed their methods since that time. Their methods have gotten so brazen that we've now had three nearly catastrophic gold crashes uh, just this year alone, uh, despite you know, amazing fundamentals and the fact that gold and silver are actually up significantly on the year. So it's really a matter of, uh, of just study and observation and uh, more importantly, getting over the, uh, the kind of human nature aspect of not wanting to believe things that are bad. And I mean, when I say things that are bad, it's not just that people don't want to, uh, you know, believe in Armageddon. It's that most people don't have the ability to act in the face of, of, of these financial calamities. They just feel, if I don't have a lot of money or any money, how could I possibly buy gold? And why? And, and under that you know, context, you could see why people would want to believe in the hope uh, a, a, that the, the government and the media and Wall Street is, is, is spewing out about how things are going to get better. Um, as far as you know, the question of, you know, gold's been going up for, for a decade, how can you say it's been suppressed? Well, yeah, it's been going up for for a decade, but it's been going up at at a minuscule rate compared to the rate of uh, of money printing. I mean, the we've seen a a, a 10x increase just in the U.S. M2 money supply since gold hit $800 in uh, or $900 in 1980. Now that's just M2. M3 isn't even published, and of course, you know there should be an M4, which would be the uh, the unpublished. Uh, covert printing of money, such as the $16 trillion of secret loans that the Fed, uh, that we now know the Fed gave out in 2008. Uh, and again, this is just what the U.S. has printed. We know that the, that the Chinese have printed more money than the U.S. because they are trying to maintain their peg. We know that the, uh, the Japanese have probably printed more money than anyone in history. And then, of course, you have the, uh, the Europeans and, and uh, essentially everyone else in the world. So in my mind, 
if gold uh, were just to just to match the the money printing that's been overt over the past few decades, we should be at fifteen to twenty thousand dollars an ounce. Uh, now, of course, if that happened, there would be a crash in the currencies because you know the other part of human nature is that when they see gold go up, they sense that things are bad. And for the most part, most people realize it, it's something monetary uh, that's bad. Uh, so, you know, th there is there is a rise in commodities, yes, and a rise in gold, but it's certainly not risen as much as it as it would have, and certainly not as much as it should have. And if it if it had done that, we would never be in the mess that we're in today. Now, Andy, you know, I've been watching this for a while too, as well, and and I I was I I was very confident that once 2008 started to blow up that we were literally heading into the end game and it was only a matter of time for the dollar to have some type of collapse. Of course, I was obviously wrong. The, the people rallied and rushed to the dollar. As you said, it was a, a different crisis. In this in this next one, how many years should Americans, how many years should the world expect to be in crisis mode? Or, or at some point in time, is there going to be a reset where we have a new currency uh, that's backed by gold? And I guess just to add into that, you know, just what, what do you envision the cartel and central bankers doing to keep the right to control and create money? Right. Well, every fiat currency in history has failed. None has ever gone past this 40 year or so uh, period before it's had a major devaluation or collapse. Um, we are at 40 years now for the dollar. The reason it's lasted to the end of that range is because the world has enmeshed itself in this dollar. It's not the U.S. dollar. It's the world dollar. Everyone's currency reserves are dollars. Everyone's transactions are dollars. Uh, basically, all of the debts that you see in some way, shape, and form can come back to the amount of, of dollar printing. So it's kind of a straitjacket that's held on the entire world, which is why you see such desperation and such cooperation from so many corners of the world to protect it. That's why you see the Japanese constantly losing money printing yen uh, to sell yen and get the dollar up, why the, the Chinese are printing yuan to sell the yuan, the yuan and get the dollar up, why the Swiss, why the Swiss are ultimately trying to devalue, devalue their currency. It all comes to a matter of if the dollar collapses, everything goes down. It's that simple. And obviously, it's it's the worst case scenario for the United States because everyone else has bought so many dollars that we have the highest standard of living and the highest uh, and the highest debt based and the highest debt of anyone. So, the U.S. is particularly um, incented to to prop up the the value of, of the dollar. Um, the problem is that, as you can see, we are now at the point where it's not going to work anymore. And uh, there will be a reset. There has to be a reset. This is not just my speculation. This is simple math. It will be reset. You will see Greece go and Italy go, and you'll see the whole chain move up until eventually the U.S. banks go, and there'll be a crisis, and the, the gold price will go up, and people will be cognizant that the dollar is not money. It's just paper. And you're going to see several years of, of, of hardship. In some places, terrible hardship. I fear there'll be starvation and there'll be, and there'll be uh, social unrest uh, and civil wars, or even world wars. This is a big deal when, when millions and billions of people uh, lose the value of their, of their net worth. Uh, so it will come down to a reset of the system. The, the system will obviously have to be reset with real money. I can't say how long that will be or in what form that will be. I can't say what uh, when it will start and it, and what form the the breakdown will be, uh, but there's nothing that I'm going to gain for it, and I certainly am not saying this in terms of well I own gold so I'm hoping for this. I'm not hoping for anything. I buy gold to protect myself from this very uh, possibility, and I tell everyone I speak to to not only uh, do things like uh, buy gold, buy food, but to just lower your expectations of of, of standard of living. It's okay. If you are a little more conservative with how you live, it's you know your happiness and your health are far more important than the number of dollars uh, that you have. I can't agree with you more. You know, I live well below my means, but I get to spend a lot of time with my son, and uh, now I have a daughter, so uh, I I can't agree with you more that you know you expect less of a living standard in the United States specifically, 
But believe me, if people focus on people and relationships, certainly their quality of life will will greatly improve. Andy, um, <clears throat> do you fear or are you concerned about the government throwing some type of wild card out there like gold confiscation or making gold illegal or taxing profits at 99%? I would say all of the above and then some. Um, this is a life or death battle. Um, for the individual, it's actual uh, physical life and death. For governments, uh, and gov when I say governments, I mean politicians and bankers who basically run things. It's the death of their power. And uh, they do have uh, an awesome amount of power uh, to, to enact things that will protect their interests. And that includes taxes, wars, uh, decrees, anything that they can do that will that will keep them in power and keep them relatively wealthy. Um, I think taxes are, are a given. I think you're going to have windfall taxes on basically anything that's making money. Certainly, uh, certainly nationalization of, of, uh, of gold mines at some point, and I'm talking about everywhere, uh, including Canada, Australia, the United States. Any, everyone is going to realize at once that gold is money, and they're all going to try to nationalize them. And that's, to me, the biggest risk uh, in over time. Um, I also believe that confiscation is something that people are going to fear um, but I don't believe that that's going to be reality because it doesn't make sense. This is not 1930, uh, where it was a gold standard. It was a U.S. centric market. There was no Eastern Hemisphere or global economy of any kind. Uh, so uh, to make a decree of gold confiscation made sense. Of course, people don't realize almost no gold was actually confiscated. The only gold that was confiscated was from, say, safety deposit boxes. And any gold that was left in the public domain, uh, which uh, I highly recommend against doing if you're going to own precious metals, make sure they're stored someplace outside of the system. Um, generally speaking, uh, gold ownership is only one way of protecting yourself from what's coming. And as you mentioned, food, uh, other life necessities. But generally speaking, realizing that in a, in a, a difficult world, in a very uncertain world, you have to just shelter yourself away from anything you could possibly think of that could hurt you, such as government decree. And you can't do everything, but you can do something. Andy, people in my generation especially, <clears throat> and, and your generation as well, so brainwashed into the fiat currency system. Uh, you know, literally the other day a family member handed me a flyer to come to some gold party where you go to sell your gold for 10 cents on the dollar. Do you, do you have a way, have you approached your family and friends? Do you have a way that, you know, so many people tell me, oh, I, I try to tell people, but they think I'm crazy. Um, you know, as the crisis accelerates and gets deeper and, and, and much, much worse, do you think as family members come around, uh, they'll be more open to hearing about what's going on with gold and silver as, as well as the overall economy? Well, right. Well, with my family and friends, it's a unique situation because of who I am. Uh, but I will say that even so, it's been a, a struggle over a 10-year period uh, to get people to listen to me. Um, uh, and, and yes, they have started to listen to me. And, and all you have to do is look at the amount of people that read what I write, which is probably about 100 people a few years ago and is probably tens of thousands today. I'm not saying anything different, but people are, you know, human nature is... When things go up, they start to watch them. And when things are bad, they start to, to, you know, listen for what the reasons are. I believe things are going to get a lot worse uh, on the social, economic, and political situation. And I believe the price of gold is going to go significantly higher. And that will draw many, many more people in that want to listen to why things are getting bad and why gold is, is going higher. Uh, so, you know, it's just getting over the hump. And, and you know, and on that on that topic, we talk about the gold cartel. Now, the gold cartel controls or has controlled the market primarily uh, on, the, on paper prices. And because most of the people I'm talking about had no interest in understanding why things were happening and just watched that paper price. But the more people that watch, the more people that are going to realize that they need to protect themselves with the real stuff. And when that happens, which could happen practically overnight in certain you know, type events, you're going to see the cartel broken. It was broken in 1968. 
uh, the London Gold Pool, and uh, gold promptly went from thirty-five dollars to nine hundred under such a, a uh, under fundamentals that don't hold the candle to today's. And it's going to happen sometime in the near future. It may happen by the end of this year if the if the if uh, the Europeans and the Federal Reserve can't keep done things under control. Now, gold obviously is the the money of kings, and silver in the last 50 to 100 years is specifically the industrial boom for silver has just been enormous an explosion do you see it possible that they could ever monetize silver again or is there just not enough silver oh absolutely they will i mean that's uh, you know i write often about the fallacies about uh, about uh, precious metals and most of them are more propaganda than anything uh, to say there's not enough silver well of course there's enough silver but at what price uh, I mean, there's, first of all, if you had higher prices, you'd have more production of silver. Not, not that it necessarily would be enough to, to satiate the demand, but higher prices will certainly uh, make silver monetizable. Um, that said, I'm not going to reach too far into the future at the ultimate solution. There's not a heck of a lot of gold either, uh, and most of, it, uh, most of the gold that, that is out there is in hands that will you know, never let it go. So... Um, you may just see the, the price of gold and silver rise simply because of their their value as as uh, as 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 money, even if it's outside of the official money system, such as a gold standard. Uh, silver is in far 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 uh, less supply than than gold. In fact, uh, silver is because of the industrial uses you're talking about has been all but consumed. Uh, throughout history, there's, it's estimated that there's less, and I mean less than a billion ounces of, quote, investable silver, meaning coins and bars out there. That's only worth about 30 or $40 billion in today's market, which is about what the Fed prints literally in the, in the space of a half an hour. Uh, so uh, gold and silver are going to go up dramatically, and they will protect your, your purchasing value. Will they ultimately be monetized? I don't know. It doesn't really matter to me. Like I said, what's coming in the future is unprecedented. Some of it may be good. A lot of it will be bad uh, compared to where we are today. But, you know, there are some immutable facts about, uh, about gold and silver and mathematics that prove that both will go up dramatically. Now, going into the holidays, we have the Super Congress. Obviously, the European crisis is, is dead center uh, in, of the attention of the markets this week. A lot of people feel like, oh, we just got through Greece, even though we really didn't. Um, if you could just expand on Italy for people a little bit, you know, going to the holidays, having the Super Congress deadline and Italy, how big is Italy compared to Greece? Yeah, and again, I, I actually wrote about these very topics uh, today. Uh, Italy is, I think, four or five times uh, larger of a problem uh, than Greece, and frankly, Italy is just about the same size of a problem as France and Great Britain. Uh, in terms of the, the overall financial risk and, and monies and monies involved, um, it's it's not that we've gotten by Greece. It's you know I mean my opinion is that the only difference between where we are today and where we were a month ago when we had a crisis and three months ago when we had a crisis was the powers that be, uh, let's call it the PPT, the QE, the gold suppression, to make markets look like something is happening positive. Um, uh, you know. Just to digress for a second, I mean, yesterday's a perfect example. The markets are down, gold is up, and then all of a sudden it says the Italian prime minister says he may resign, and, and all of a sudden the Dow jumps and gold drops. And the media and a lot of investors still believe things like that that was somehow some positive development, when in fact it's actually a negative development. There's no way it's a positive one. Um, what you're seeing in Greece is a complete collapse. It's a smaller country. Uh, they do, uh, so it doesn't get as much fanfare as in Italy. Uh, people have moved on to Italy because, as we speak, Italian bonds are doing exactly what Greek bonds did. So now the, you know, the, the all the press coverage is going there. But Greece has the same problems as before. It will default. It has 200% short-term rates. It has a, an uncertain bailout coming from funds that are uncertain to start with. And uh, it, there will be a daisy chain. It will not be fenced in. But it will probably be dwarfed by what's going on in Italy, which is much, much bigger of a problem. And uh, today, look at the French spread. In fact, I just read this morning that today was the largest uh, widening day of, uh, of 
bond spreads, meaning Italian bonds versus Germans and French versus uh, Germans, ever in history. Uh, so you're seeing it spread across Europe, and the larger countries are now going to get more press, but they're all going to go down, particularly the ones like Greece. Andy, how can people subscribe and get on your email list? Right. Uh, again, I work for Miles Franklin. We're, uh, we're a bullion dealer uh, based in, in the United States. Uh, our website is uh, milesfranklin.com. If you just uh, go to the home page, uh, I think it's in the top right of the box. It'll say subscribe uh, to our reports. You'll get a daily blog uh, that I write with, uh, with the founder of our firm, David Schechtman, who himself has been a gold market expert for two or three decades. And uh, I'm always open to any phone calls or emails at any time. Andy, over at Miles Franklin, you guys, uh, is, is the gold storage um, something new that you guys have added? Yeah, um, this is a very important aspect because uh, you did ask about gold confiscation. Now, I'm not, every, some people believe that will happen and some don't. But for many reasons, aside from confiscation, uh, it's, it can be a very, very smart decision to move some of your gold out of your personal hands and into the hands of, uh, of, of, of a storage facility. We offer storage facilities uh, in the States in North Dakota, uh, a Brinks facility in Montreal, which I'll be going to uh, take a visit of next month and write a report on. Uh, for very minimal cost, you will, be, you will have your money safely stored, and that protects you against a whole variety of, of uh, risks, uh, including confiscation, uh, theft, etc. And I believe that this is going to be a very, very um, popular trend as the uh, political situation destabilizes in the Western world. And just to be clear for people, uh, Miles Franklin is not just a gold storage and silver storage company. You guys also deliver physical precious metals of all varieties. No, we are primarily a, a bullion company. Our primary business is selling gold and silver coins and platinum coins, but we are developing the storage service. Uh, because of demand that our customers have asked for. Um, and uh, we're looking always for new ways to help our customers. But our primary business is, uh, is sale of gold and silver coins. We've been uh, successfully doing this for 21 years. All right. Well, especially with, uh, you know, um, you know, there's a lot of sharks out there like that company. Uh, I'm not even going to mention them, but uh, Glenn Beck and Sean Hannity advertise them all the time. It's good to know that there are companies like Miles Franklin out there that, you know, that are honestly not only the people answering the phone are buying bullion, but they believe the same way uh, you and I do, where they're buying the metal for protection. Yes, I joined this firm uh, because I met David Schechtman earlier this year. He's one of the most honorable people that I know. And the reason he got into the business 20 years ago is the same reason that I got into the business now, and that's to help people to protect themselves. And uh, it took 20 years to build the reputation of this firm to where it is now. And as a result, I think um, I think we're going to really be able to help a lot of people in the coming years. That's awesome. Andy, thank you so much for being with us today. Again, uh, go to milesfranklin.com if you want to subscribe to Andy's email. I read them every single day. Uh, they're a crucial part of my own education in knowing what's going on and, and understanding the price manipulation. I honestly believe Andy Hoffman, and I know there's a lot of great people out there, but I believe he knows more than anybody about price manipulation. Thanks, Andy. Thanks very much, Daniel.